You are listening to Keep Canada Weird, a weekly weird news roundup by the Nighttime Podcast. Hello, listeners, and welcome back to the weekly Keep Canada Weird discussion series. If you're new here, Keep Canada Weird is the venue in which my pal Handsome Aaron Airport and I seek out and explore the more offbeat Canadian news stories from the past week. In tonight's episode, which we recorded on the evening of October 2nd, 2023, Aaron and I tackle some heavy topics. We discuss a cat found in an engine during an oil change in Saskatchewan. We'll talk about the plan to kill all the rabbits on a Vancouver island. We're going to hear about the beehive that was stolen from a church. And of course, we'll weigh in on a man from Guelph's very expensive lewd photos. Let's get into it. Handsome Aaron Airport. It's a beautiful day. It's October. It's October 2nd that we're recording this, and I feel great. I also feel wonderful. Uh, you like autumn as much as I do, don't you? I love autumn. It's a wonderful time. The weather is perfect. Uh, the air is crisp. The The leaves are colorful and poetic and bountiful and dying, and they die. <laughs> <laughs> they die. Well, it's uh, it, fall really came on strong. I was walking over the weekend and it was like it was snowing out or raining out of just leaves, just leaves were falling. Yeah. All I felt like I was in a poem. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Robert Frost poem. Uh, isn't Robert Frost like the children's author? No, he's a poet, isn't he? Um, he's like one of those typical poets that you'd read in junior high or something. Okay, I thought he was the author of like Mortimer in the Paper Bag Princess. Oh no, no, no! That's Robert Munch. Robert Munch. Okay, <laughs> different, <laughs> way different. <laughs> we are off to the off to the races on tonight's episode. I felt like I was in a Robert Munch book. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just yeah. Kids okay. singing at me. Um, mm -hmm. How have you been? Anything new? What is new? Not much. Just the usual. Um, you know, observing the weirdness of Canada as usual. Yeah, you're just keeping your finger on the pulse of... Yeah, yeah. Just kind of uh, feeling out the animal uprising and keeping my eye on Tim Hortons and yeah, all those things that I do every day. Um, this isn't one of the stories that I want to get into tonight, but uh, seeing as you keep your finger on the pulse of Canadian news, specifically the odd and offbeat. I'm here in Halifax and we had like a little bit of a situation over the weekend that maybe made its way across your desk. I don't know like the story of this, but every year around this time, it becomes like this uh, topic of public interest in Halifax news about these massive outdoor parties and i'm not uh, that students are throwing because we have a lot of universities in halifax but when i say like outdoor parties i mean like sh like multiple streets being blocked off just full of people i'm going to play you one little clip because uh, this is mm. this just happened over the last couple days in in my city and I, I don't know what to think of it listen to this Good evening. We begin with some ongoing breaking news. Halifax Regional Police say they're dealing with a large street party on this Sunday afternoon. In a tweet a short time ago, HRP said officers are, quote, on the scene of an unsanctioned student gathering near Preston, Larch and Jennings streets in Halifax. Due to the size of the crowds, we're asking the public to stay away. Officers have made arrests and summary offense tickets have been issued. We remind the public that any action that unreasonably disturbs the neighborhood will result in charges. A number of people on social media have made reference to Dalhousie Homecoming, which is technically next weekend, but it coincides with Thanksgiving. The event has been a major issue in previous years. We will continue to monitor developments for you. Yeah, it's like for people listening that uh, didn't see the video of that, that was a big outdoor party. I don't think I've partied hard for years, but I've never been to something like that. No, no, I've never been to a party like that. Uh, it's when you're older, you know, when I'm not sure what year of your life becomes a threshold, but all of a sudden you become very aware of what is causing a disturbance or not when you're there. Mm -hmm. like. Do you remember the first party that you were at where you started to be concerned about, are we bothering the neighbors being outside, you know, having beers on the, on the back step and 
Yeah, yeah. It, it, I don't remember when it first happened, but I do remember a time when I didn't give a crap about the neighbors. And then I remembered mm. a time where like some of my friends were idiots because I'm like, guys, like people live around here. You morons. Yeah, like even having music playing on the back step, you know, in the summertime. Yeah. Maybe there's six or seven of you hanging out in the backyard having a fire mm. and uh and and you have the radio you know, at a, at a reasonable level. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, ah, I'm starting to get uncomfortable. <laughs> the neighbors are probably, you can see the curtains kind of opening up a little bit and they're kind of eyeing out who you are. And, oh, is yeah. this going to be an all-nighter? Is this <laughs> going to be keeping yeah. me up? I have to work tomorrow. And I, so I start to become uncomfortable now if I'm at a party and I feel like it's uh, potentially disturbing the neighbors. Mm, uh, in that clip where they described the party, it, they seemed to make a, a point of... Um calling out that it was an unsanctioned party have you ever been to an unsanctioned par or have you ever been to a sanctioned party um not officially okay. I, uh, I'd be I, i've never had any uh government body come to a party and officially sanction it you know <laughs> i would just wonder when i heard that news like the so much of the news was repeating like that tweet that the halifax police put out about the unsanctioned party and i i um just thought like what the process would even be. I would just out of curiosity, like sometime when you're in Halifax and we're going to do something some night, we should like contact the police and request sanctioning just to see if mm -hmm. like what I'd the like actual that. process is. I would love that because then if you are sanctioned and a neighbor complains, you can be like, sorry, I'm like, sanctioned. This whole thing has been reviewed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I gave them all of the details, uh, where we'd be sitting, the playlist. how many of this there would be, the, the music list, the drinks that we'll be having, mm -hmm. the time in which we'll be outside, and uh, and they officially sanctioned it, so there's <laughs> nothing you can do. Um, well, that's a story for another day. we got to get into this. You know why we're here. Everyone listening knows why we're here. We're here to keep Canada weird by seeking out and highlighting the unique, offbeat, unusual, and unexpected stories that played out over the last week here in the Great White North. Uh, we're going to be talking about a purring engine in Saskatchewan. We're going to be talking about a... We're going to be talking about the Vancouver Rabbit Massacre and the people who are seeking to prevent it from happening. We're going to hear why bee thieves go to hell. And then we'll talk about some expensive lewd photographs. But before we get into any of that, you want to hear a voice memo? I'd like to hear as many voicemails as you'll let me. We got so many great ones. Um, so I'll sprinkle them out throughout the episode. But the mm, first one. But give me two. Give me two. I'm right giving now. you one. You got to hold on. We got oh, we got a no. long show. Um, I don't even care about the stories. I just want to listen to voicemails <laughs> all night. Uh, somehow we got entrenched up to our waists in discussion of the Wonder Bar. I don't know how we even got on this topic, but we got a voice memo about Wonder Bar. This is from a listener named Sarah. Hello, I'm Jordan and a handsome air in the airport. This is Sarah down in Georgia. Just wanted to let you know, I had never heard of Wonder Bar, so I looked them up and spelled them incorrectly. I spelled it with an O instead of a U. And the first thing that pops up is a chocolate bar made with psychedelic mushrooms. So I assumed that was not the correct Wonder Bar, but I did. I was able to locate the correct one with a U. Um, they look really good. Thanks for that tip. I'm going to order some. Hope you guys are having a great day and keep Canada weird. I didn't know there was a psychedelic bar called the Wonder Bar. Not well, I don't know if the pronunciation be any different, but W O N is like a mushroom trip. W U M is like a crispy peanut butter kind of thing. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Well, you see a lot of those, uh, like you know, wee gummies or edibles of some kind that either strongly resemble a current chocolate bar or candy. And they kind of play with the with either the wording or the packaging to make it kind of resemble those. Um, I think where companies can get into a lot of trouble that way, maybe mm -hmm. uh, because if they're you know if they're a weed bar or whatever, and kids consume it, that can mm -hmm. kind of get dicey. Well, I'm more worried about what if we're talking about Wonder Bars and we're offering to male listeners Wonder Bars because they're so great, and then listeners think like, I uh, maybe I should just buy some of those Wonder Bars. And no, it's thing. always no, it's always buyer beware when you're getting free chocolate bars from a podcast. 
Mm, no, but I mean, what about the listener who overhears us talking about these Wonder Bars site and goes online and just orders some of them and eats them, feeds them to our kids? Turns out it's the W O N D E R bars. That could be an issue. Uh, uh not for us that's an issue with them um that's... you know the devil's in the details and they need to really read the fine print when they're ordering delicious treats on the internet okay there that's on you if something goes wrong yeah i do not <laughs> sanction them buying weed bars <laughs> that weed bar it was magic mushrooms whatever <laughs> gosh all the same camp yeah um isn't it uh, I assume so. Let's get into it here. Where do you want to start with this? We're going to go with engines, rabbits, bees, or dick pics. Uh, let's start with the dick pics. You know, <laughs> no, let's say that. most conversations on Tinder start with a dick pic. So why shouldn't we start this podcast with one? Let's save it. Come on. Oh, you want to get right into yeah. that? Okay, let's do it. You asked for it. This is a, a story I'm going to read to you. This is again one of those, um, the police issue a press release in the news reports on it. In mm -hmm. this case, because it's so salacious. So it, it, this involves a Guelph man, Guelph, Ontario, who's owed a little over $1,100 and owed also a couple, couple photos of his penis and uh, police aren't doing a damn thing about it. Here's what's going on. Guelph police say a man was extorted for more than $1,000 after he sent nude images to someone he thought was a female. Police said the man made a report at the police station on Tuesday morning. He said he was contacted at about 1.30 a.m. that day, or basically after midnight the night before. The conversation quickly turned sexual. Within 15 minutes, he was sending what he thought was a woman some nude photographs of himself. The other user immediately demanded payment or else the photos would be shared with everyone on his contact list. Police said he ended up sending $1,000 via e-transfer and another $100 in iTunes gift cards. He claimed to have no more money and the contact stopped and the contact stopped and the images were not shared. Guelph police are urging people to be very cautious when asked to share intimate images as they are as they say they are often used to extort money from victims. These crimes are almost impossible to investigate, the investigating officer said. Mm -hmm. So you've done a lot more like online dating and stuff than me. So I, I feel like you're going to have a more intelligent take on this. <laughs> well my policy is to never ever send a picture of my penis to anybody <laughs> regardless, <laughs> good advice. regardless yeah that's a good policy yeah 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 that's a that's a blanket policy that no matter who's asking mm -hmm. no matter what the circumstances are no matter how comfortable i am with the individual even if you're asking jordan for a picture of my penis and i trust you with my life you wouldn't do it you're not getting it. uh no. the i just think this guy who's involved in this story this to have it escalate from like someone contacts you at 1 30 and 15 minutes later that's happening that just that seems like yeah. an intense conversation like i've heard of love at first sight and of course we've all experienced like lust at first sight but in 15 minutes like they, you'd have to be even be able to text fast to get to that point in 15 minutes like i'm a slow typer i'd have a hard time even getting mm. there well, I mean, again, a lot of, um, you know, I've talked to women uh, who, you know, shared their experiences with men on dating sites, and a lot of men lead with a, a picture of their penis. You know, that's how that's an icebreaker for wow. them. So the start of the conversation is, here's my penis. Uh, what do you do in your free time? <laughs> do you have kids? Um the kids. <laughs> wow. Okay. Well, <laughs> do you like hiking? there's uh, there's so much about people that I don't know. I when I re re interviewed uh, Ava James, the OnlyFans teacher, she talked ab about um, one of her main kind of requests is like reviews. Like uh, uh, followers of her or subscribers to OnlyFans would want to send uh, lewd photographs of themselves and have her kind of criticize them. And she told me like, oh, that's like that's a thing. Lots of people want that. Uh, to me, it seems mm -hmm. unimaginable. Just like also when I hear of a foot fetish, um, like a guy's having foot fetishes. I'm just, I don't think I know anyone in my own life, at least not openly. Well, yeah, not openly, but I guarantee out of 
all of the men that you know, I'd say 15% of them have a foot fetish. 15%. At least, okay. yeah. At wow, least. Um, yeah. I'm surprised. Are you surprised? I'm not one of them. I'm just not putting one it out of them, there. Just for the okay. record. Uh, what yeah. about this? Um, are you surprised that this fellow went to the police? Because it seems like, yeah, he was being extorted, but they did what they said. They said, you send us the money. We're not going to send the photos to everyone. Mm -hmm. He gave them the money. They didn't do it. It seems like they kind of made a deal there, but... Yeah, and I wouldn't have sent them the money to begin with. I would have called their bluff mm -hmm. because I really don't think they're able to do yeah. that. You know, I mean, they can obviously do it, but that opens up a whole other can of worms legally if you start sending a, a picture of somebody's penis mm -hmm. to other people. Um, like as you <laughs> as we talk though, could you not keep saying penis? Like at first it was all right, but we know what the pictures of now. So let's say the lewd photograph. Oh, are you uncomfortable with that word? Well, after 15 times, 20 times, I'm starting to get it. Um, you just seem to... Well, just don't you count just them seem, and then you'll be you fine. You just seem to enjoy saying it. But... It's a clinical <laughs> term. I'm not saying... Doctor. I'm not saying all Dr. of... Dr. Yes, Handsome. Thank you. <laughs> I demand respect. <laughs> um, uh, no, I mean, it's it's. there's so many other words we could be using other than the clinical that's term. That's true. Uh, so I think we're... I think we're being very respectful with with the language that we're yeah, choosing or i am anyway <laughs> uh they threatened to send it to everyone on his contact list they would have needed to not only in 15 minutes convince him to send photos but they would have had to like hack him or something uh, i think i think most of those now i'm not saying that all of them aren't legitimate in terms of um following through with their threats uh and maybe having the ability to do so um, but for eleven hundred dollars, I think I'm okay with people on my contact seeing my penis. <laughs> like <laughs> I would just message them saying, Hey, you I know, had the I was hacked or whatever, and it happened. Yes, that's me. Uh, but I was not paying eleven hundred dollars to prevent you from seeing that. <laughs> yeah, sorry you had to get that message, but I'm not spending a lot. <laughs> I like that way to deal with it. And I yeah, just be honest and open. Like, you didn't send it to them. The hacker did, right? right? So The hacker's the one who should be embarrassed. And you could also say, it's not my penis. It's it's just a generic penis from the <laughs> internet. <laughs> you know? um, yeah. It's just clip art. It's a clip art <laughs> of a penis. Uh, all right. Well, let's get on to a more comfortable topic. Uh, let's... I'm very comfortable with this topic. I let's... Don't... You know, you you're uncomfortable. Let's chase the eleven hundred dollar loot photos with um, a refreshing glass of a purring engine in Saskatchewan. We love cat stories, and I we've made mm -hmm. a commitment early on in the show that is if there's a story involving a cat in the news in Canada, we will give it. We we will amplify the message to the Keep Canada Weird Nation through this show. And that's what we're about to do right now. Cats are in the news again. Mm -hmm. This involves service technicians at Lakeland Hyundai in Saskatoon who were performing a routine oil change on a car this past Friday when they began to realize something altogether different was going on with the vehicle. As they were doing their work, they started to hear an awful, a god-awful sound coming from the front end of the vehicle. I think maybe you'd describe the sound as a caterwaul, I think is the appropriate term. Listen to this. An injured kitten is in recovery after being rescued from an engine during an oil change at a Prince Albert dealership. The story is serving as a reminder to the public to keep an eye out for small animals stuck in engines as we head into the fall season. CTV's Stacey, Stacey Hine has more. While engines usually purr, this one meows. We both heard like this really awful sound and I thought she just came in for an oil change so I don't think it was anything mechanical related. During a routine oil change, workers at Lakeland Hyundai found this kitten under the hood. So when the customer came in, the cat was pretty much just right on top of here and its little paw and its legs were stuck within that one there. She called her coworker over to help rescue the kitten. But did have a little bird on its fur and it was limping a little bit, but other than that, it it's perfectly fine. She estimates it had been in there for about 20 minutes because the customer lives out of town. The customer who was in for the service 
uh, one of their neighbor's kittens had gotten out or it was a stray, got under the hood to keep warm, as they often do uh, as it gets colder out in the year. Mazunski says shortly after finding it, his wife picked up the kitten and took it to the vet. He adds it's not uncommon for squirrels, mice and kittens to warm up by an engine as temperatures drop. When you get in your vehicle, especially again September, October, November, give it a couple honks. That'll scare whatever it is in there before you start your car up and they'll usually take off. He says the kitten is getting a full physical from the vet and then one of their service advisors will adopt it. I think that little fur ball is lucky to be alive. Mm. But but maybe it's maybe it's safe from there than we think because the owner of that vehicle would have had to drive the vehicle all the way to the mechanics place. So I assume the cat was in there the whole time and survived that. So I don't know why it like kind of freaked out during the oil change, unless maybe it was like moved to a different section of the car or something. And then they started the engine and it Mm -hmm. lost its mind. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure there was a number of different sights and smells, you know, kind of a different environment that the cat was in uh, that made it freak out. But um I really, I know you noticed this too, uh, but I noticed the pronunciation of, of, of kittens, like uh, Kitten. kittens, like the the yeah. reporter at the start of the story, really hit those T's very hard. Kitten, Kitten. yeah. But then <laughs> later, she just kind of dissolves back into how most people pronounce it by not really hitting the T's very hard with just kittens. Hmm. I wonder if that was like a note from their editor or something. What, what, what yeah, I don't know because that way? she she really hits it hard the first time she says it, kitten. You know, and then later on uh, she's just kitten. What stands out to me is they interview like the sales manager for this dealership and they ask him for advice. It seems on how to prevent this from happening to animals. And his advice is be- like when you get up in the morning before you drive your car, honk your horn a few times. And I, I just think like is. Are we willing to sacrifice all of our sanity in the morning for yeah, the a couple cats and squirrels? Honk, honk, Just honk, 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 honk. <laughs> Could you imagine what it would be like in a major city? Well, it would be less noticeable in a major city if you lived like right downtown, because I imagine there's a Could... lot of horns being honked anyway. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But in a, you know, a quiet suburban neighborhood, yeah, that'd be very annoying. It would definitely, mm-hmm. uh, especially as someone who likes to sleep in. Did you ever get anything weird living in your car? Not that I'm aware of. And if there was, I want some rent. Uh, I had, uh, how did it start? It was, um, I was finding this weird, like fuzzy stuff, like this white kind of almost looked like cotton balls. I found a bunch of it in my driveway and I was like, what is all this crap? I was like, that's really weird. And I didn't think anything of it. I just thought maybe like, you know, something blew into my yard from down the street or something. Uh, it kind of looked like insulation or cotton balls. And then like a couple days later, I got in my car and I noticed um, like where the windshield meets the hood on the outside, I noticed some of the stuff there. And I'm like, whoa, like that's like half in my car, half out of my car. And it's that same stuff I saw the other day. And so I wanted to see how it was stuck in there. And I got out and I opened my hood of my car and the entire hood was like jammed with this white, like cottony ball stuff. So I pulled it all out and I knew something, some kind of animal dragged it in there. So I went to the mechanic to make sure everything was okay. And what he had told me was that it was, um, there's some kind of like insulation like on the bottom of the car to make it so that when you're in your car, you don't hear loud noises. Mm-hmm. You know, you don't hear the road. And he said he, some animal must have got in and it pulled up a bunch of pulled out a bunch of that insulation and made like a nest next to my engine. And he said, I just used like a leaf blower and blew it all out of there and it's no damage. But wow, I guess I could have. Mm. He, he said the only risk could have been like, uh, you know, if, if enough leaves and crap kind of if they had to pulled stuff like that in there it could have started a fire it yeah, could start a fire yeah, but see that yeah but what was what happened with me it was none of that stuff was flammable so i survived and i don't think i killed anything I well know. who knows it wasn't there like what happened to it if it built a nest what yeah you know what got rid want... of it i hope it was just outside of the nest when i got in my car that day and found it um or maybe one of the service advisors took it or one of the service technicians may have took it and made it their own like they were with that cat. It's going for the cat in this story is going for a checkup. If everything is OK, one of the technicians are going to take it home and mm-hmm. make it their own. I think that's nice. That's a nice story to have, you know, to have a cat and 
have a nice story like that as its as its origin story, you know? That cat is being saved, but we got some, I'm just looking at the list of our topics tonight and I'm realizing we got a lot of animals and yeah. living creatures on the list. Uh, we just heard about a cat being saved in, Sask in Saskatchewan, but now we're going to move over to British Columbia where it sounds like a bunch of rabbits are not going to be saved. Although some people are fighting to save the rabbits. I called this uh, story on our list, the Vancouver rabbit massacre, because it seems like that may be what's about to happen. Uh, dozens of animal welfare activists gathered on Vancouver's Granville Island just yesterday, Sunday, to, pro to protest the controversial decision to trap and euthanize the area's growing rabbit population. A euthanize is a nice way to put it, but we know what they're going to do to those friggin' bunnies. Listen to this story. Tell me if this upsets you. At first, there was only one, a black rabbit with a small mark on its nose, likely a household pet abandoned by someone who didn't want it anymore. And then a few months later, a gray rabbit showed up, handsome young bugger, and suddenly there were lots and lots of little rabbits. And what was cute at the beginning became a nuisance when Ron Bassford Park near the Granville Island Hotel was suddenly home to more than 40 rabbits. The bunnies not only attracted tourists, but coyotes too. We've already always had them, but there are now more than we ever had before. Authorities on Granville Island tell CTV News they tried to relocate the animals to sanctuaries, but they were already full. Concerned about public safety, they decided to trap the rabbits, take them to a vet to be euthanized. Well, I don't think that they should euthanize the poor little things. I think that they should um, find a place for them. Olga Betts of Vancouver Rabbit Rescue argues the animals are perfectly healthy, so there's no reason why they can't be spayed or neutered and then kept here in an enclosure. And they could be part of the attraction of going to Granville Island. But they should not be penalized for human stupidity. In other words, this all began because a pet owner was irresponsible. Don't dump them, please because it causes distress for everybody and every animal. A lot of people think, oh, that'll be nice for my bunny. It can play with the other rabbits. Well, rabbits don't play together when they don't know one another. The resident rabbits will attack your rabbit and uh, it'd, be, it would be very unlikely to survive. Granville Island says a new rabbit enclosure is not something it can take on. It would still attract coyotes. And it's reminding everyone that dumping rabbits is illegal. Just makes me sad. I, I like this idea that, uh, you know, like they described, you know, you, a, a rabbit owner may be like, I want my rabbit to, you know, live out its life playing with the other rabbits. But no, all that's going to happen, they're just going to fight and kill each other and have too many babies for it to become a problem. And someone at the government who needs to come and kill all the rabbits. What is sad. We live in a dark world. Yeah. And the, the reporter on that story, um, really sold it like a like a movie preview like first there was one rabbit and then there were more <laughs> and the way he kind of like led into each statement it was always like i could just hear the dramatic music in the background like explosions happening everywhere machine gun fire and mm. the rabbits started reproducing like never before <laughs> Yeah, putting a dramatic twist mm. on this story, but but it did work. I preferred the like little British lady who was like the handsome little bugger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I liked I liked her, and also even the animal welfare person. Um, I don't recall her name, but uh, I, I thought everyone who came together for that story uh, did a good job of, uh, of of getting us caught up in the situation that's going on on that island. Uh, I don't know what to do with it. I, I don't think euthanizing them is the correct. Um, outcome though i like the idea of spaying and neutering them yeah and relocating so they can't them have somewhere else or, or even keeping them there but but control their population by not allowing them to breed like rabbits yeah rabbits are notorious uh for doing such things F fornicating yeah Fornicators. fornicating yeah um, um we're filled well, with technical you, terms tonight you and i should be yeah. uh, like uh, sexual doctors it should be podcasters, yeah. but like in more serious, in more serious, <laughs> like real ones. Did you hear that in Canada, if a podcast 
makes over ten million dollars, they need to like register with the government. Yeah, I heard something about that. It's part of that yeah, new that's... bill or whatever. Yeah, uh, the bill that's making like C eleven is that C eleven? C yeah, so like you know, it's making Facebook and Meta not share the news in Canada yeah. and all this other stuff. But yeah, the latest thing is podcasts making over ten million need to register. So the question is, when we contact to register, because you know, with that kind of threshold, we will have to. Uh, I don't know what the, uh, that's going to be interesting, but that's a, that's a topic for another day. Yeah, yeah. But in conclusion, save the rabbits. It's not the rabbit's fault. It's the human's fault. Uh, let's that, not punish the rabbits. Let's do whatever we can human, to protect their lives. You remember how they said um, if there's too many rabbits in the island, it could be a it, it could attract coyotes. Yes, that's right. I thought that was interesting because we've been talking a lot about coyotes lately. Yeah. The last several weeks we got into coyotes. Yeah. And I got a voice memo here from a listener um, who's providing us an update on what's happening where they are. And their update certainly involves coyotes. And when I say giving us an update, this is a correspondent reporting on the animal uprising in British Columbia. The front lines. Listen to this. This is Trina. Hi, guys. I'm a new listener to the show, and I love keeping Canada weird. I just have a note on the animal uprising. Uh, I'm from Vanderhoof, BC, and earlier this week, there was an article on CBC that five people in Prince George, BC, were attacked by aggressive coyotes. And they thought that it was one animal responsible, but they're not sure. And four of the five people ended up going to hospital. You should definitely check it out, and I'd love to hear about it on the show. Have a great night, guys. Bye. Let me tell you, I did check it out. Uh, she's not lying. She's not exaggerating. Two of the people who were attacked were um, young children. Like one was like a toddler. And then one, I think I saw, I think I saw like a five-year-old was attacked. Then a couple adults. So it's, uh, and, and that was five within just like, I think like a week or two. Uh, and in searching for, for when I got that voice memo, in searching for the story they're referencing, I found several other like smaller articles covering coyote attacks just in the last week across Canada. Um, so I think the listeners are really finding something going on with coyotes. I don't know if it's the time of year. I don't know if they're just choosing to play a larger role in the uprising, but look out. Well, I see the coyotes almost like almost like the pawn pieces on a chessboard of the of animal uprising. So the pawns, you know, are right at the front and they're kind of making the first moves and they're setting the ground. They're they're doing the preliminary attacks and then the wave behind them will then will then come along after that. So I see the coyotes in the overall outlook of the uprising as as the initial instigators that are taking out uh whatever they can. Um with what they have, uh, what resources that the coyotes have, which is teeth, you know, teeth and 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 claws and fastness. One thing we know for sure is that the animal uprising is real, um, and it's seems to be getting faster and more intense every day that goes by. But it's also not just a Canadian or American phenomenon. I have another report from a listener, a correspondent on the animal uprising. This is Astrid from Germany letting us know what's going on. I guess that's across the pond. <laughs> Listen to what she had to say. Big pond. Hey, Aaron. Hey, Jordan. I'm Astrid from Frankfurt am Main in Germany. And now that autumn is beginning, I would briefly like to tell you what was going on in this strange country during the silly season in summer. Hashtag animal uprising. <laughs> so a lion has broken out in Berlin in July and citizens were shivering with fear. Authorities didn't know where it broke out from but since there was an eyewitness and even a blurry photo, a major police operation ensued. Even the army helped with a tank. Yes, think about that, a tank. However, guess what inspired after transpired after 30 hours? 
It wasn't a lion at all. It was a wild boar. Right. A wild boar. Let Ooh. me explain. The animal uprising wanted to spread fear and terror in the German capital. But lions are rare and wild boars are plentiful. So the animal uprising speculated on people's stupidity, rightly so, and sent a wild boar that obviously had previously learned to roar like a lion. Then friends of the animal uprising took this ridiculous photo, see picture sent by mail, knowing that only one species would be stupid enough to think there was really a lion to see in the mishmash of brown and green colors. And of course, they were right. In the end, the police action had cost upwards of 100,000 euros and all of Germany's animals had a good hearty laugh at people's stupidity. As you can see, the animal uprising is capable of complex operations, so be aware. I love your show. I hope you sent me some very sweet dessert or treat from Canada and have a good day. Bye. <laughs> I'm speechless. Yeah. You know, it, it kind of reminded me of how I think it would be after the uprising occurs, after several years of the uprising playing out, and there's not a lot of humans left, but there are some, and we're hiding in basements and sewers and and, and wherever we can find to kind of eventually regroup. But um, and And maybe, you know, you're in this bunker somewhere and you have a very small radio, and you're always kind of tuning it to try and find and see if any broadcasts eventually mm -hmm. come across the airwaves. And then all of a sudden, one day you hear the you're you're tuning the radio and you hear the crackling of the radio, and all of a sudden that message comes over the airwaves. <laughs> yeah, like just from on your shortwave radio. Yeah, you get this message from Germany. Uh, Asher, that was amazing i was on the edge of my seat for the entire voice memo uh, she mentioned see picture by mail i have a feeling maybe at least i'm spec i'm su suspecting i'm going to get a photograph in the mail from her if so i hope she included a return address so i can send her some delicious desserts from canada as she requested yeah. if well, this is if becoming very much like um a bit of a theme now with People leaving voicemails are expecting desserts from us. You know? <laughs> yeah, I'm okay with it. Yeah, I just wonder, you know, with our affiliation with the Canadian government, is uh, is customs going to have an issue with this? Are going to start looking at us closer? You know, like uh, yeah. And are people oh. just kind of now? I'm I'm a little worried now that maybe I'm gonna, you know, a listener is like, well, I want to, I want some free Canadian desserts, so I'm just gonna make up an animal uprising story and call in to uh well that's nighttimepodcast.com slash contact mm, uh that's why we have fact checkers everything we say is vetted fact checked cross-referenced double checked uh government um sanctioned mm -hmm. we're all good and that goes for voice memos as well astrid if you did not send a return address in a photo Email nighttimepodcast at gmail.com and let us know where I can send you something. I'll send something special. Even if Aaron doesn't think I should be doing it, I'm going to break ranks here and send something to Germany. No, I want I want her to have nice sweet treats from Canada, but I just I just hope that people are are not compromising the quality of animal uprising reporting on the ground reporting just so they can get a free wonder bar. I we talked about coyotes kind of being the front lines of the animal uprising. I do like the idea of the animals just like pushing the boars out, being like, mm -hmm. "You guys go and freak them out." Uh, I think she, 
like you said, you know, flipping through the radio and you hear a voice in the darkness when you think there's no one else but you alive and you find someone who knows as much or more than mm. you ever did about the animal uprising. That's Astrid. That's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Let's get on to our last story of the night. Um, bee lovers have been waiting all night to hear what we mean by bee thieves are going to hell. Well, hell, of course, is a religious construct. Uh, if there is a literal hell, the way to get there is by screwing with the Christian or Catholic church. And that's why I called this, epi- this section of the episode, Bee Thieves Go to Hell. This, invol- this involves a hive of 20,000 bees that were stolen from a North Vancouver church grounds. St. Andrew's United Church has been home to a beehive for almost two years, and the insects have become well-loved members of the community. But then, last Wednesday, someone swiped the hive and all its bees from the church grounds. A bizarre theft at a North Vancouver church. Someone buzzed off with a beehive and all of its bees. St. Andrew's United Church had the hive installed two years ago in a bid to boost falling honeybee numbers. Reverend Judith Hardcastle says the bees were taken last Wednesday. She checked on the hive and it was safe and sound in the morning, but it was gone later that day. Hardcastle says it feels like a part of their congregation has been taken. We're out here looking at watching them sort of take the hive apart and holding the screens. I've even stroked a drone <laughs> and seen the queen bee, and it's a real learning experience for everybody. So we feel a personal you know, affinity with them. When asked if the thief would be forgiven if the bees are brought back, she says with a laugh that she definitely would, but the RCMP might not. You know damn well, Aaron, I'm terrified of bees. I would never stroke a drone. No, no, unless it was paying me. (laughs) Um, Yeah, $1,100. Yeah, or I'm posting your bee to all your friends on your contact list. Yeah. Um, Would you, as stealing from a church ground or a church, even as someone who is not religious, I would not do that. No, I mean, I don't know. Just in case. Um, Listen, I don't I don't think that a church anyway, I don't know what I'm I should, I, I I'm going to stop myself there. So Wait, yeah, if you if you're just uh, talking off the seat of your pants and then you get into church, you should, like a, the topic of church, that's your sign. To- yeah, yeah, yeah. I just realized I should I should I should stop right there. <laughs> I just I'm trying to usually with stories like this, like with with weird thefts, I try to think about why would they steal that thing? So why would someone or a group of people steal bees? Regardless if it was from a church or not, someone's yard, you know, maybe you keep bees in your backyard. They can't be worth that much because you would think like the, the bees, like, of course their output, like the honey and stuff that's, that's worth money. But it's, I think the expense in getting the honey isn't so much like buying the bee and the hive. It's like the maintenance and dealing with it and, you know, all that sort of stuff. It seems – and then someone who's capable of, like, dealing with a hive of bees, you think they'd already have a bunch of bees. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Someone who's, someone who's comfortable with bees has bees already. And that's it, how they're yeah. comfortable with bees because they're around bees all the time. Um, but maybe so it's hard to understand the motivation. So usually with crimes where I can't understand the motivation, then the group that I focus in on as potential suspects are teenagers, because oftentimes teenagers will steal for no good reason at all. So I'm wondering if this is a group of teenagers that maybe is familiar to the church. Uh, maybe they've vandalized in the area before. And maybe they're like, dude, there's a bunch of bees at the church. Did you know that? Like, yeah, yeah, I saw that. We should take them. Yeah, I've I've done many stupid things uh, as a teenager and an adult. But the idea of grabbing a beehive and running off with it, I feel like it it just wouldn't happen. I you would I would need to contact a like a biologist or whatever. I I think they use like a special smoke that makes they spray it. 
Yeah. So someone would need that. I think if you're going to pick up the whole hive and move it somewhere, they would need to have one of those suits on where they have the helmet thing where it's like a screen and they can't get stung. What we I don't should the whole do, nine. not we, but <laughs> what the authority should do is see if anyone in the local emergency rooms <laughs> were admitted for bee stings. Mm. There's a couple teenagers in the hospital. Somewhere. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm, that that's an easy. Or one check to with solve. the local pharmacies. You know who picked up the proper ingredients for for bee stings. You know for yeah, anti venom or whatever it is. Because it, yeah, it's either teenagers or people who breed and deal with bees. But and those there can't types be that don't. Yeah, those types don't strike me as as a type of of people to steal at all like usually mm -hmm. people who keep bees are are law-abiding respectful nerdy citizens who love bees mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. exactly yeah I, I don't know i think uh you want to solve this case please look at hospitals hospital and emergency rooms yeah that's that's where i'd start if i was the detective on this case mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't think they're going to be. Yeah, they say. Um, it sounds like one of those like YA novels, like the, you know, the youth kind of novels, like where there's like teenager detectives and they like solve crimes like the case of the missing skateboard or, mm. you know, the case of the stolen cookies. And, and this would be a case that I think the teenager detectives uh, would be good for in some kind of a some kind of a, uh, you know, book. I think the book would be ruined though, because I think it would be kind of like um, financed or like affiliated with the church in some way. And like they would catch them and then they would eventually go on to like confess their sins and like, you know, change their ways and join the church like these thieves and find like a better life. And I have a feeling at like the beginning of the book would be good and then it just get kind of crazy. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyways. Uh, Let's end the show here with uh, we got a couple voice memos before we wrap this up. Do you still got any juice left in the tank? I got all the the juice needed. Do you want to talk about ideas for our Halloween special, which we're working hard on behind the scenes? Or do you want to hear about our favorite topic, Tim Hortons? Both at the same time. <laughs> Tim Hortons it is. Yeah. <laughs> here it comes. This is Aaron. Uh, a listener in the United States who we've been accused of, you know, you guys hate on Tim Hortons. You hate on them so much that you're giving them free press. Well, here's a listener on t in the United States who I think bought some Tim Hortons stuff to see what we we're complaining about. Listen to this. Hey, Jordan and Aaron. Uh, this is Aaron from Alabama. Um, I just, first of all, want to give a shout out to the other Birmingham Alabamian that called in on the Encounters with Creeps uh, episode. So shout out. Um, so this is a Tim Hortons story. Um, I never really thought that I could be so disgusted with a company that I don't know a thing about. But I was in Walmart the other day just browsing the cold brew coffee aisle. And I spotted a new product, Tim Hortons cold brew, eight servings. Okay. It's a little container. And I literally made an audible sound of disgust and then went over to it to get a picture just so that I would remember to call in. But I found myself trying to be very discreet uh, while I was taking the picture because I didn't want to bring attention to the product. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, thinking that if I took a picture, somebody else might say, hey, what's that cool thing oh, over yeah. there? So uh, anyways, the flavors, mocha cereal. Really? <laughs> what is that? Uh, and birthday cake. So anyways, there's uh, there's my, uh, I guess, weird news from the U.S. for the week. We have yeah. a lot of um, uh, correspondents all around the world who are bringing stories of the Animal Uprising and Tim Hortons. Uh, yeah. I really, Tim I Hortons, really enjoy that. Birthday cake tentacles slowly making their way across the border. Yeah. yeah, we should explain that Tim Hortons is obsessed with birthday birthday cake flavored things. They made birthday cake 
um, donuts in Timbits, I think, yeah. that were kind of popular. And now it's just birthday cake. Yeah, well, I've never heard of them. The, the flavor to cereal as well. They had the uh, the Timbits yes. cereal and they did the birthday cake flavor for that. Must have done well. And now they got whatever that nonsense was. Uh, I like um, the, the one flavor she described or she mentioned. I've never heard of mocha cereal, but that does strike me as like something Tim Hortons would come up with, which mm. is probably just like, you know, they probably have something called a mocha. They just add more sugar and they're like, this is our new mocha cereal. And I really, flavor. I know. And I really appreciate her not trying to draw attention to the product to make sure that she's not promoting Tim Hortons even accidentally <laughs> to yeah. anybody else in the <laughs> aisles that are seeing her taking a photo of it. Like doesn't want any association with it. Yeah, yeah. I really appreciate that and yeah. uh, respect it. Yeah, similarly, you know, you see like a car accident or something and you want to like take a quick picture, I don't know, or something like that. You, you know, you don't want someone to see you doing something that trashy. That's the way she handled the Tim Hortons products in the mm -hmm. cold brew section. Uh, we appreciate that message, Aaron, from Alabama. Uh, let's hear a little bit about, um, we'll end the show with some Halloween ideas and with a little discussion about that. But this one from Kara. I don't know. I think this is a hit. Listen. Hi, Jordan and Aaron. This is Kara. I'm a listener from your neighbor to the South, North Carolina. I've been listening about a year. I've also gone back and listened to most of your old episodes. Love them. I love Canada. I was in Halifax last year and Canadians. I love Canadians. Most of them. Not the criminals, obviously, or the jerks. You probably can't tell because I know I have a very cosmopolitan accent, but I am a native Southerner. Anywho, you asked about ideas for a Halloween show. I was thinking maybe have listeners call in about their encounters with ghosts, the supernatural, kind of like your encounters with creep show. If you go with that, I have a pretty creepy story from years ago that happened when I was in high school. My dad, who was an estate lawyer, had to get a vacant house ready for sale the next day after one of the homeowners had gone to prison for shooting and killing her husband. He dropped me off mid-July at this house to mow the lawn. And weird things started happening when I went into the house to get a glass of water. If that's your theme, I can tell you a little more about what happened. Nothing remotely supernatural ever happened to me again, but it's a good story for Halloween. Anyway, your show is fun. Keep Canadian weird, Canadian gothic, all of it. Well done. Thank you very much. Is North Carolina our neighbor to the south, or do they just mean America? The America, yeah. yeah. Okay. Our neighbor to the south. Mm. I guess we don't have one. It's literally, like where we are, Nova Scotia. To the south would just be water. Do you, do you know anything about geography? No, I don't want to no, talk okay. about this. <laughs> uh, what do you think of this idea? of? I, I've done something in the past that I called nighttime's haunted listeners and that was listeners who've had experiences with the supernatural mm -hmm. with the beyond with the otherworldly sharing their stories uh with me either in the style of an interview where we could connect and talk on zoom or whatever or just in the style of voice memos much like i do with the encounters with creep series what i thought when i heard this from Kara, i thought that's an amazing idea um to, to do something like that but what i thought would really mix it up to make it like special is have listeners share their stories of ghosts supernatural encounters but we could have yourself myself and maybe we could get madeline klein from the encounters with creep series and have the three of us and do kind of like a group collab mm, halloween special love that idea yeah and and i think if we if madeline and i on our uh, on our episodes that we record, call out to listeners. You and I call out to keep Canada weird nation for these stories. Maybe we'll get a whole bunch, yeah, of supernatural ghost stories, and we could do a big long thing that we uh, where, where we listen to them, talk about them, uh, maybe get so scared that we even have to end the episode early. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I hope I don't get too scared, but um, I'd love to. Yeah, listeners, give us all of your creepy ghosts weird halloween stories and let's see if we can get enough to do this i love this idea uh i think the trio of you and i and madeline would be fantastic to tackle this 
Mm-hmm. And yeah, I love hearing from the Keep Canada Weird Nation, even in just in regular mm-hmm. voicemails. So to hear mm-hmm. some true life weird stories from them, Halloween based, would be incredible. With that said, any listeners out there um, at all who've experienced or saw something they couldn't explain, um, an odd feeling, a burning ship they saw out in the harbor and then it disappeared, um, a ghost, a Ouija board that went bonkers. We want to hear about it. You can do it in the style of a voice memo. You can go to nighttimepodcast.com and send a voice memo. Um, but you can also send an email to me at nighttimepodcast at gmail.com. Maybe if you want to talk out your story and you're open to some follow-up questions, uh, we can work out something like that as well. So contact me and we'll make this special. It'd be great to hear from a whole bunch of people, a whole bunch of nighttime's haunted listeners. Yes. And that's only one of our many Halloween specials. I go big for Halloween. Mm. So I, I wanna have a I wanna have a couple. We'll probably call out for something different every week and have 15 Halloween specials. How's that? Yeah, but most importantly, keep those voicemails coming and give us some scary ones coming up to Halloween. Mm. Well, with that said, I think we've we've done our work here. We've kept Canada weird. We heard about cats, rabbits, bees, dick pics, ghosts. Anything else we need to say or do, or are we ready to wrap this up? I think we've uh, done it all here tonight, and I think it's time for bed. Handsome Aaron Airport, until next time. Jordan, until next time. Um, honk your engine. Not your engine. Honk your horn three times or four times as soon as you wake up in the morning and before you go to bed. And uh, Jordan, until next time, if uh, you're you're pulling into your driveway and there's a massive university party going on next door, honk your horn a few times then too and that'll get rid of those pests. I want to thank you for helping Aaron and I fulfill our mission to keep Canada weird, but let us also call out to you for even greater support. If something weird happens in your neck of the woods, we invite you to join the army of Keep Canada Weird correspondents by telling us about it. You can send us a voice memo at nighttimepodcast.com slash contact. Now, before we part here, let me again call out to all the listeners of Nighttime who've had a weird experience with the unexplained. A ghost, a shadowy figure. Hell, if you've even seen a werewolf, we'd like to hear about it for our Halloween special. If you have anything like that to share, you can do it in a voice memo, again, through nighttimepodcast.com slash contact, or you can contact me at nighttimepodcast at gmail.com, and I'll help arrange something with you. I hope to hear from you. Now, I'm going to start wrapping things up tonight, but let me end with some thanks. First, a big thanks to Aaron for sharing another evening with me and with you, the listeners of Nighttime. A shout out to the internet's favorite cult leader, Unicole, who provides our intro and outro voiceovers, and Monty Data, who contributes the music. And then lastly, but most importantly, a massive thanks goes out to each and every one of you listening to Nighttime, as without your interest and your support, this show would be as pointless as it would be impossible. Now on the topic of support, let me thank the newest subscribers to the premium feed. Lolly, Kara, and Anna, thank you for going premium. And for anyone else who'd like to support the show, you can do it in a variety of ways. First of all, a premium feed subscription costs only a couple dollars a month, and that money funds the creation of the show. But a premium feed subscription also gives you the episodes two days early, gives them to you ad-free, and gives you access to a full back catalog of episodes. If it sounds like something you're interested in, you can go premium right now at patreon.com slash contact, and all annual subscribers get a free nighttime and keep Canada weird swag pack by mail. And for whatever reason, if you don't want to go premium, but want to support the show, you can do so for free by simply sharing this episode on social media and letting some like-minded friends know what we're doing here. Your help in growing the show is very much appreciated. So until we meet again, take care of each other, hug your loved ones tight, let me know if you see anything weird. Keep Canada Weird is written, hosted, and produced by the Nighttime Podcast. 